Okay. Um, welcome to, I didn't mean anything by it, how racial microaggressions are perceived, part of a series of online discussions brought to you by the ACRL University Library Section's Professional Development Committee. I am Greg Serbeck, a member of the committee. I will be moderating this program along with my colleague, Rebecca Graff. This is one of an ongoing series of online programs sponsored by our committee. This session is being recorded, and when the, court, when the recording is ready, we will send a link to the video to everyone who registered for the program. The program today will consist of approximately 45 minutes of presentation from our presenter, including question and answer session. Please post your questions in the chat box, and we'll, we will collect all of them and answer as many of them as we can. Uh, we will post a link to the program assessment in the chat box after the Q&A session. Uh, when we do that, please take a few moments to give us your feedback on today's program. With those announcements out of the way, I'm very happy to start today's program. We are joined today by Audrey Robinson Congola. She's assistant professor, campus librarian at Western Kentucky University. She's presented locally and regionally about microaggressions and is the co-author of a library, Journal of Library Administration article, Dropped In Without a Parachute. Uh, uh, without further delay, I will thank you for everyone who um, decided to join us for this webinar. I appreciate it. So we'll begin. I didn't mean anything by it. I used the title. I use this phrase in the title because when someone says a microaggression, I ask them about it and they use this phrase. I was raised in predominantly, I was raised, my story, I was raised in predominantly white rural family farming community in Indiana. When I moved from one small town, Corden, to another, Ramsey, I began to experience microaggressions. Dr. Daryl Sue, who created a taxonomy or a classification for microaggressions, would call what I experienced as microassaults. I was physically and verbally abused on the bus daily. I was called black the B word or the N word and pushed and tripped. I, class this, I classified this experience as bullying, but it was racially motivated. It finally ended when a community mediator met with the families involved, but not before one parent said, I view all black people as an N-word. I'm a first generation college graduate. I went to a Midwestern, somewhat rural and predominantly white university. In linguistics class, a professor was talking about the African-American vernacular. He looked at the black students and his, and his eyes he looked at the black students and his eyes fell on me. He said, you know people who speak ebonics. My point in sharing my story is microaggressions happen to people of color or POC in every stage, in every aspect of our everyday lives. Now there's a language and taxonomy to explain what we're experiencing. So, what are, my, what are racial microaggressions? According to Arnold Crawford and Khalif, microaggressions are one, automatic or unconscious, subtle, verbal or nonverbal insults directed at people of color, two, layered insults based on race, gender, class, sexuality, language, immigration status, phenotype, accent or surname. Three, cumulative insults that cause unnecessary stress to people of color while privileging whites. There also are brief and commonplace daily verbal environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostility, derogatory or negative racial slights and insults to the target person or group. Let me emphasize the word daily. Microaggressions happen to POCs on a daily basis. 
sometimes multiple times a day at work, in our cars, in the stores, everywhere. Microaggressions are so insidious because they are env environmental. A person of color can be exposed to an office setting that excludes or minimizes or may insignificant his or her racial identity by the exclusion of decorations or literature that represents various racial groups. The taxonomy of microaggressions are expressed in three forms, microassaults, microinsults, and microinvalidations. Microassaults, according to Daryl Sue et al., microassaults are explicit racial degradation characterized primarily by a verbal or nonverbal attack meant to hurt the intended victim through name calling, avoidant behavior, or purposeful discriminatory action, calling someone oriental, or the Don Animus incident with the Rutgers basketball team. He called them nappy headed hoes. Some people think this incident was a micro insult. However, due to the name calling and the various words he used to describe it, to describe the women, I'm classifying it as a micro assault. Black Americana postcards have illustrated here have two children or the racist term used Piccaninny. The Piccaninny is a racial caricature of black children. I found these cards in an antique secondhand consignment shop. These cards were the first thing I saw when I walked in. The man in the scooter in the upper right hand corner, top picture, has a Confederate battle flag attached to his motorized wheelchair. I was in a dollar store by my home when I took this picture. I see the battle flag every day around my house. The picture of then Senator Obama and Mrs. Michelle Obama was publicized, published in the New Yorker in 2008. The illustrators and others called this cartoon satirical, meaning the image was making fun of those who said the Obamas were Muslim, U.S. hating terrorists. Below the picture, the caption read, politics of fear. What makes it racist is the dab and the Afro and they are African American. Everything in the picture is sending a message. In 2008, Serena Williams lost to Naomi Osaka at the U.S. Open. Williams during the match was penalized by the referee for her outburst. John McEnroe, who is legendary for his outbursts, do not have pictures of him in his outburst. Therefore, this cartoon has racist and sexist issues. Mark Knight, editorial cartoonist for the Herald Sun, and others said the cartoon was not racist. His intent was to depict William's childish outburst. It is easy for someone who's not a person of color to say something is not racist. That's like a man saying something is not sexist. I see no difference between the Americana cards and this cartoon. Here is when perception comes into play with microaggressions. Should the person of color be concerned of the intent of the cartoonist? How should a POC interpret these images? The burden is placed on the POC to perceive these illustrations in a positive light. Themes within the, within the attitudes and behaviors of microaggressions. First, micro insults. They are defined by communication that conveys rudeness and sensitivity and demean a person's racial heritage and identity. For example, I've been asked how I got the job I have. The implication is that I'm not qualified for my job due to my race or ethnicity, or I have the job 
to my rate due to my race and ethnicity and not to my qualify due to my qualifications. Alien in, in one's own land experienced mostly by Latinos and Asian Americans. They are asked, where are you from? No, where really, where are you from originally? Implying that because they are Latinos, Asian Americans, they're not US citizens or native born citizens. Second class citizenship, um, people of color receive poor service in a store, implied less the implication is they're less of an American due to their racial or ethnic background. Pathologizing cultural values and styles, treating someone's cultural values and styles as abnormal. For example, a black woman's natural hair in a professional business setting, dismissing an individual who brings up race or culture at work or school, a script, a description of intelligence. Wow, you are really smart. Someone said this to me in an email. This implies that most black people are dumb and they are surprised that I'm not. Assumption of criminality. Assume you're going to steal something from the store. Therefore, you're followed. My great aunt took my sisters and me to the store when we were children. She told us to put, not to put our hands in our pockets while walking around the store. I still don't. Micro invalidations, communications that exclude, negate, or nullify the psychological thoughts, feelings, and experiences of a person of color. For example, Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter. Myth of meritocracy. Meritocracy is a system in which the talented are chosen and moved ahead at the basis of their achievement. Everyone can succeed in the society if they work hard enough. Environmental invalidations. Overabundance of you see the overabundance of pawn shops and liquor stores in communities of color. Exoticization and objectification. The person of color is sexualized and portrayed as an anomaly due to his or her race. Denial of individual racism. Whites want to deny their racism. They want to see themselves as good moral people. Unfortunately, by, by denying their individual racism, it becomes more evident. I'm not racist, I have several black friends. I saw a meme on Facebook or Instagram with Thomas Jefferson picture. The caption read, I'm not racist, my girlfriend is black. Another one is, as a woman, I know what you go through as a racial minority. For every ism, colorism, racism, sex sexism, ageism, homophobiaism, a position of a position of privilege exists. For example, a black heterosexual male have privilege in certain spaces that a black LGBTQ male does not. In the case of a white woman telling a woman of color that she understands her as a racial minority, she's forgetting her white privilege exists in many spaces that does not exist for the woman of color. Color blindness. According to Dr. Sue, color blindness is a major form of micro invalidation because it denies the racial and the experience of POC and provides an excuse to white people to claim they're not prejudiced. Franklin, Jeremy Flank, Franklin states, colorblind racism is a notion that racism today operates with an assumption that society is, that the society is post-racial 
and that people do not see race. Racial microaggressions, I will know when I hear or see them. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, I will know when I hear or see them, not necessarily. According to Mercer, microaggressions are subtle indignities and insults that minority groups may experience in their daily lives. Sometimes microaggressions are obvious, other times, POC may question whether their behavior, that behavior or comment was really a microaggression. For example, I had to buy a new phone. The sales rep suggested a cheaper phone. Another woman who seems to be rich based upon the wedding ring she was wearing walked into the store. After she left, I asked the sales rep would he have said the same thing to the rich white lady. He said yes, but I didn't believe him. I believe he was making a decision based upon how I was dressed and my race, implying I could not afford a more expensive phone. I'm still not sure about, about this. You are not crazy, people of color. Empirical data exists that validates the POC experiences with microaggressions. Mercer created a tool called the Inventory of Microaggressions Against Black Individuals, or IMABI. They were able to measure micro insults and micro invalidations based upon Dr. Sue's taxonomy. Dr. Gerald Sue also created tax, taxonomy, sorry, for racial microaggressions. Nedal, who worked with Dr. Sue, created the racial eth ethnic microaggression scale and able to measure microaggressions. The effects of microaggressions. These are real experiences that people of color have. Um, depression, difficulty at work, um, low self-esteem, feeling of powerlessness and self-doubt. And racial battle fatigue is defined um, by Smith, Hung, and Franklin as an interdisciplinary theoretical framework that considers the increased levels of psychosocial stressors and sub subsequent psychological, physiological, and behavioral responses of fighting racial microaggressions. In other words, by fighting microaggressions on a regular basis, um, the person of color develops psychosocial, physical, and psychological issues as a result. For the person of color, For the person of color, what is helpful and what isn't helpful. Understand that you are, understand that you're being treated, the way you're being treated is not you, but it is a microaggression. Seeing counseling from a POC or someone who understands about microaggressions and its effects, talk to friends and family, Sometimes confronting the microaggressor is not easy because he or she will rational, rationalize why the comments are or behavior isn't racist. Many times you're left with wondering if you should feel offended or if the behavior was a microaggression. You can do something, vote in the primaries and in local elections 
and sheriff and sheriff and some prosecutors are elected officials. The mayor supervises the police department. And also we are called for duty, 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 participate when you can. What can someone from the dominant culture do? The person of color understands that you do not view yourself as a racist. You want to have the best possible view of yourselves. Being a racist does not fit your internal view. However, you have been socialized and raised in a racist society. Understand that you may have racial bias. Do not become defensive if a person of color confronts you about their concerns. Instead, accept your racial bias and work to change it. Administrators, supervisors, tenure and promotion committees. You attend the diversity and inclusion webinars and workshops or accompany the person of color you send to these trainings. When a person of color informs you of an issue they're dealing with, they're not belligerent, lazy, being difficult, or uncooperative, or the common denominator in a situation involving a student or other faculty. Look at your departments. How does it maintain white privilege or racial bias? How many and how often are people of color promoted? Be more than an advocate, be an ally. It is not enough to pull out the only person of color in the department in an interview for a person of color candidate. Are there any questions, comments? Yes, there are definitely some questions. Rebecca is going to be uh, moderating a couple questions for you uh, that came up. Um, and uh, while Rebecca prepares that, um, others can feel free to uh, add additional questions in the chat. Uh, but Rebecca, are you ready to, uh, to pr uh, have uh, the first questions for, uh, for Audrey? Yes, I am. Um, so how can you know if microaggressions are racial or personal? Um, if, if they speak to someone's, would, for example, would you say to a, um, a person, a white person, um, are you smart or, um, you're so smart, um, would you ask them where they're from? That kind of thing. If there are attitudes that you have towards a person of color, you, you can express them in a comment or the way you, even the way you behave to the person of color. And trust me, that person of color will definitely know. So it's more towards um, someone of the dominant culture to be aware of comments that might um, not speak well to the um, person of color or actions, actions of avoidance as well. I hope I answered that question. That's how you can, that's how you can tell. Um, so would, we, have, we have a lot of questions okay, would about you, that one. Yeah, would you say, would you, for example, um, white female, white male, uh, would you say you're so smart in an email to another um, someone, white male or female, uh, would you ask them where are they from? Um, you know, would you make comments about their hair um, that I had someone make a comment that I should uh, do something, not do something about my hair, but make suggestions about my hair um, because I wore a natural and another person was experiencing the same thing. If the person had straight hair or 
chemicals in their hair. The supervisor didn't say anything. So it's that kind of actions and behaviors is what makes it microaggressions. So there's a related question. Can you give some phrases or expressions we can use when somebody says a microaggression? You know, how do you respond to that? I've gotten a couple questions about that. Especially I would, I would ask. In the dominant culture. I would ask what they, what do they mean by that? What was their intent? Um, because I can't give you any phrases, but I would, I would allow the person of the dominant culture to elaborate on what they meant. Okay. I was told, you know, to smile a lot. I asked the person, what do they mean by that? So where exactly is the distinction between microaggression and macroaggression? From what I understand, because microaggressions are subtle, um, they are not, they're sometimes barely noticeable um, in the definition. If we go back and look at the definition, it's brief and commonplace daily and verbal environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostility derogatory or negative slights and insults to the target person. So, I mean, they're so slight. They're so, uh, you, you barely can notice them. And, and it's, you're constantly questioning whether or not this person actually meant what, how the dominant the white person or person of, um, person of the dominant culture actually meant how the person of color actually perceived. And microaggression, I think of lynching, I think of um, cross burning, um, something that's on a larger schedule, scale that's obvious. Um, the church bombings that, that occurred, um, the going to South Carolina and shooting up every, and going to church in South Carolina and shooting up every, all the black people in that church. I consider those as um, macroaggressions. Okay. Um. Do you have any recommendations for recognizing and resolving institutional microaggressions, as in systems within an institution that can, that could be insulting or invalidating to persons of color? Um, mentorship for the persons of color. Um, it can be with another person of color. It could be with, say, for example, if someone's going up for for a tenure and promotion. It can be someone who's outside the department who can provide information about, or inside the department who can provide information about um, tenure and promotion. Um, and the, the um, tenure and promotion someone on tenure and promotion committee, mentor the person of color, um, have specific guidelines that applies to everyone. Um, be, I think what helps is being really clear on the expectations that applies across the board. I was reading um, an article about these two, um, they were African-American, who was up for tenure promotion. One was suggested that he should wait. 
before he went up to tenure and promotion and publish more. No one else had to do that but him. So, like I said, make clear the guidelines. And also, if you are in a public space um, or in public services and students are complaining about the, the faculty member or the librarian in that position, don't just assume that it's the librarian. Do, <laughs> do some research. Find out what's going on. Uh, ask for help from someone, a person of color who's outside of that department. Ask them what's going on. Just don't assume and that the person is having problems just because of their personality. It could be that they're having problems because there have been studies showed, shown that actually black males and, and teachers and leadership and um, that they are able to say and do things that black women can't. So figure out what's going on, talk to Talk to the person and find out what's going on before you make um, knee-jerk assumptions about what you think might be going on or that you're just getting complaints or concerns um, from others. So a number of people have asked, you know, their member, people want to know about the culture of persons of, cult of color, but are afraid to mention anything. Um, a number of participants have made book suggestions and articles and videos. Do you have anything in particular you'd recommend for helping somebody break the ice and, and join the conversation? That's pretty tricky. Um, if they have a truly interest, um, take a class. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be flip about this. Read a book um, because I've had the experience where people are interested, seem, appear to be interested, and it went really wrong um, quickly. My, honestly, my defense mechanisms, like, okay, why are they interested? Um, so I think I would ask that question first. It's like, you know, what interests do they have? Uh, it could be they're interested in hair because they adopted uh, a child of color. So I would try to find out why they're interested, but I would say if they're really interested, if they are at the university or a college, take a class, take a African American studies class, um, or pick up a book and, and read, I would say for me, um, and that would show genuine interest because it's another, I was reading another article, it, it becomes difficult to want to have, to answer people's questions about your culture, about your hair, about the food that you eat. It becomes overwhelming and tiring. And when you go into a space where you don't have to answer those questions, uh, or become the teacher to someone, it's more, it's freer and a, a good space for the person of color. So that would be my suggestion. Um, 
So there's a question, and I think I know the answer, but I we want to hear you talk about it. Is there such a thing as microaggressions or even macroaggression among people of color? Not I mean, the person, not only blacks, but um, among black people, but of people of other races or ethnicities. Yes, we're all, you know, we're all human. We all have bias, you know, we all have bias. Um, this presentation is focused on racial bias. So, like I said, there's ageism, colorism, sexism, um, homophobia, ism. So everyone has bias um, against somebody that's not that's not like them. So one person asked earlier, and I think it's relevant here. Um, do you think a lot of these microaggressions have to do with insec personal insecurities? Like the person of color in is insecure? No, as the person making the comments are insecure. Oh, um, I would, I, yes, yes, I would think so because um, if you have to, or feeling uncomfortable or don't know, do not have to, or do not know how to relate to the person of color. Like for example, um, I get invited to a lot of African-American events, which I appreciate. I like attending those events, but it doesn't really acknowledge me as a whole person. I, uh, I like um, British literature as well. Um, I like British comedy. Um, I like, I don't know a lot about it, but I like listening to classical music. Um, so if you are just focusing on one on one area, then that's problematic. So, you know, involve involve yourself, involve other people into various events. Did I answer that question? I think you did. Okay. Um, can you suggest tips for reconciling the need of those in the dominant culture to actively learn about other cultures um, with a desire not to expect people of color to be the representative of everyone in their race or, cult, or, race or ethnicity? <coughs> I think you did some of this. But. Yeah, I mean, like I said, um, pick up, um, pick up a book. Sorry, I just coughed. <coughs> okay. Excuse me, I'm going to get some water. <coughs> Sorry. That's, hey, we all cough. <coughs> um, you know, have, have a conversation and it doesn't have to be about, it doesn't necessarily have to be about race or about a person's race. Um, like I said, um, attend events from, you know, if there's, if you want to learn about Chinese or Asian culture, if there are events on your campus, attend events. Um, support those events. Um, if you want to learn, learning, a, although only a language I know very well is English, but if you want to learn about uh, Latino culture more, take a Spanish class. Um, so yeah, just, just, just participate and attend 
diversity and inclusion um, web, webinars, workshops, I think that would help. Because a person of color, I mean, doesn't always, ha like you said, you know, I don't want to be a representative for everyone in my race. I can't be for one because there's diversity there. I so can only represent you. I can only represent myself. Um, so if the person's interested, truly interested, attend events, um, ask how you can, if there's a Black History Month event, ask how you can help. Ask how you per can participate. You know, if, if it's, I think it's for the Day of the Dead, ask how, if they are having events, ask how you can help. Good suggestions. Um, if microaggressions are sometimes unintentional, how do you explain this to the person that their comments are microaggressions? That's tricky. That's really tricky. Um, I've, I've tried it. If, <clears throat> excuse me. It's okay. If, if the person, I've had to, someone had told me to smile for two years. And unfortunately, I internalized that. Um, someone called me kiddo for a long time and I had to say because I had a working relationship with them I had to say you know this is this is a micro I asked them several times could they not do that and then when it finally when they didn't stop I had to say to them listen I believe this is microaggression and it needs to stop. I didn't say it that way, but um, close. If you, if, if you have a working relationship with this person and if it's causing discomfort, if um, you have a relationship with this person, like a personal relationship, friendship, whatever, or if you're invested in this person and they're saying things, definitely, absolutely say something. But it, I'm not sure if it's worth the energy that it would take to explain to someone when those cases do not exist whether it's microaggression or not. You know what I'm saying? If it's mm -hmm. a person passing by. Um, right. It's a person worth their time. It may not be worth the effort. Right. You don't have to fight all battles all the time. Exactly. Exactly. Racial battle fatigue. You don't have, I mean, that's, that's real. And um, you don't want you know, you need to practice self-care. And I think that would be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, are there other questions? I think there's one about how do you, um, a class on culture might not help somebody who, who's not able to hear it at this point. How can you help them make small steps? I feel like it's, once again, it's placing the burden on a person of color to educate someone in a dominant culture. Um, I feel like that they need to make small steps. And like I said, if you attend events, if you go to, okay, you know, for Western at the moment, classes are free, free to full-time staff and faculty. So if you're not in that situation, uh, ask how you can help um, with workshops, 
with presentations um, during Black History Month. Um, ask how you can participate. So you're, you are a part of doing something or so you're learning about the culture in that way just by I mean it's not going to happen overnight but if you do that that shows that you're serious and that you're committed uh, and that you're you're interested okay uh, uh, Rebecca are there is there any any final questions or I don't believe so um, there's been some fantastic um, uh, comments and, and links oh, in the we in have the chat. we have a final question sure let's um, do it um, you've mentioned having people of color on search committees can you speak to your experience well <clears throat> Very few have been on a search committee that I, when I've interviewed, except for maybe one or two. Um, most most times, it's um, they find a black person to either have dinner with or sit um, when the staff interview me or something like that or faculty interview me is it's most times it's not the committee who's they're not on the committee um and some and you know that's i think they want me to feel comfortable which is great but you know i think they're trying to show that there is diversity on campus, but I'm saying that that's not enough. That's not enough. I mean, just to have one person, a person of color, come to uh, an interview or come to lunch or dinner, it's not enough. There has to be a real investment in diversity and inclusion. And um, people of color are not seeing that, a real commitment as a result of what issues they have on, the, on um, university and college campuses. Right, also, um, as I think of it, I know not, not all of us are members of ARL institutions, but in the next couple of months, I believe ARL is having a conference about some of these um, issues. I'll try to find the URL. Okay. So um, I just want to uh, to thank Audrey for courageously sharing her personal experience and expertise on such an important topic. A uh, number of commenters are indicating that they'd like to see more on this. So thank you so much, Audrey, for for starting us off, starting a great conversation uh, and an important conversation. Um, and we are gonna try and do our best to um, not copy the comments, so to speak, because we, you know, some of those are sort of, might be personal, but at least see if we can grab some of the URLs out of there and include those with uh, the video when we post it to ACRL's YouTube page. Um, thank you also to my co-moderator, Rebecca. Fantastic job uh, running the questions. And the entire ACRL ULS Professional Development Committee. Uh, I would also like to thank Eloa Sharp and Sophie Skinner from ACRL. Remember that we will send a link to this recording for the session once it's available. Um, please fill out the assessment, assessment instrument, um, which is being posted uh, any moment now. Thank you, and um, uh, the committee is, uh, so this is the final um, session of this, uh, of this academic year, uh, but the committee is hard at work on preparing another series of webinars to commence in the fall. So we hope you will join us. Uh, thanks again, Audrey and everyone. Thank you.